All right, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of our faculty staff forums of the spring 2023 semester. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker and I'll introduce myself before I do that. My name is Erica Benson. I'm the interim director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. And I'm delighted to see such a big crowd today. We also have a crowd online joining us on Zoom. So if you'd like, you can wave to the to the friends that we have on Zoom joining us. David has assured us that there are many, many people there. Um, so welcome to those online as well. David Shi is a professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and he served as our first Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Fellow, and is also the recipient of our Excellence in EDI Award, as well as the MLK Juniors excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr. Social Justice Award. He's published his writing at the New York Times, NPR's Code Switch, Inside Higher Ed, and other outlets. And he has been cited in the Chronicle of Higher Education, US News and World Report, and Ed Week. He has discussed his ideas as a guest on NPR's All Things Considered and other radio shows and podcasts. And he also regularly presents his work at local, regional, and national conferences and other audiences. His first book that you see on the screen, the cover of which you see on the screen behind us, is Chinese Prodigal, a memoir in eight arguments, and it's forthcoming from Grove Atlantic. So today, he's going to discuss the process that led to this book, and he will also finish with a short reading. We'll have some time after Dr. Xi's presentation for audience questions, so please prepare those, those who are sitting with us and those of you who are online, please make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions and those will be read aloud to our presenter. So one request for you, David, when a folks in the room are asking questions, we ask that you repeat them for the online audience because the microphone won't pick up everybody's voice. Sure. But please join me in welcoming Dr. David Shi. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Erica, so much. Uh, thank all of you for coming here today uh, for my talk, which is entitled Writing a Memoir and Essays, a Reading from Chinese Prodigal. And uh, we have about 40 minutes, which I think is the perfect amount of time for a talk. Um, and I'll, I'll talk for about 10 minutes or so about the process that, um, you know, that brought me to this. The book hasn't been released yet. This is an advanced reader's copy. Um, and then I'll, I'll read for about 20 minutes, and then there should be time for, for some questions and answers. Um, I don't want to forget to thank um, the people who had something to do with uh, this project coming to fruition. So first of all, thanks to all of you uh, here and remotely for all of your support um, in making this, this dream come true. I also want to thank ORSP and the Sabbatical Award Committee uh, for the full year leave that I had over uh, 2020 and 2021 that helped me finish writing Chinese Prodigal. And I want to thank my wife, Robin, who's here with us today for everything else. Uh, you know, she can attest to that, um, that academic year. It coincided with the pandemic uh, year. And so I would, I would wake up, uh, really not get dressed at all, walk downstairs to my, my basement office, and, and uh, my family wouldn't see me for several hours. And then I would emerge after hopefully having written productively for that day. So thank you all. So I want to talk about um, what uh, what brought uh, me here today to talk to you, and um, it really started around 2014, late 2014, and um, I decided that I um, I wanted to do a different kind of writing than the academic writing that um, I was used to and had been trained in. And I thought it was important to be able to write for the general public. After all, um, in the classes that I teach, I think I have to uh, explain some fairly um, complex ideas and sophisticated ideas for my students. And if um, you know my evaluations were any 
indication. I thought that it it went very well. And I was very curious about whether I could translate that onto the page. Um, and I wanted I wanted to write about race and racism, which is what I taught about in the classes, but I didn't want to read it a year or two later when it got published in a journal. Um, these were exigent issues and they needed uh, to be talked about and ideas circulated at that time. And at the time, you know, blogging was the way that you might do that. So I, I started my own blog on um, Blogspot, originally entitled David Shi. <laughs> um, and I started um, just writing about a number of current events having to do with racism in the public eye. Um, because I wasn't really satisfied with the way that it was being written about in 2014, by and large, for the general public. And what I mean by that is that um, there would be these discussions of, of race and racism in, um, in public discourse, but they wouldn't be very good, quite honestly, that they weren't sophisticated, they weren't, they weren't critical. And what I mean by that is that they very rarely touched on power. And they very rarely touched on kind of historical manifestations of power when it came to white people and people of color in this country. And so I, I set about trying to do that, trying to bridge that divide between academic writing and this more popular writing about race and uh, created a kind of hybrid form. Um, and uh, I know that one of my, my former students is uh, watching on um, Zoom right now, and I don't think I would be here talking to you today if we didn't have a conversation one day about our families. She's a, a white woman with uh, mixed race children, and we just started talking about how um, Thanksgiving became a really fraught time of year for both of us and for so many of our students, most of whom are white, and we would talk about how they would go back home and want to talk about what they were learning uh, from their classes, my class, but also so many other classes. And um, it would just be very tense. And not only that, they would have their loved ones, their parents, their uncles, their grandfathers, push their buttons, trigger them, uh, not believe them, not honor what they were learning, not honor that they truly believed what they were saying. And it was such a, an interesting and sad commentary on the state of the culture that I thought that there had been a real turn in our culture when the people who are supposed to care about you most would rather listen to strangers on cable television or over email than the people that they've known um, for so much of their lives. And so I wanted to write about that. And so I wrote this blog post called Racism at Thanksgiving. And that's how it all, it all got started. And, and those were all uh, published uh, by myself on, um, on Blogspot. Very easy for anybody to do. It still exists. And to get the word out, that's when I really started taking Twitter seriously. So I would get on Twitter. And there were a lot of um, intellectuals that I would follow, um, public intellectuals. And if I would write a blog that mentioned them, I would tag them and I would say, thank you for whatever you said or whatever you wrote. And I wrote this blog um, that included that. And so, you know, here's an example from 2015. I think I wrote uh, a blog entitled White Supremacy Can Make You Poor. It was about some fairly controversial um, comments that Patricia Arquette had made, I think, at the Emmys that year. And um, Sherilyn Eiffel, who is at the time the executive director of the NAACP um, Legal Defense Fund, had uh, made a comment about that. And so I incorporated her words into my blog. And so this is, you know, one of my favorite moments, just a little humble brag here, you know, where you can get Sherilyn Eiffel to respond to you with some kind words. And I, I realized then if you could get smart black women to agree with you about racism, 
and the meanings that you were assigning uh, to things, you were doing something right. And so that gave me um, courage, honestly, to, to keep going and keep writing. And um, I, um, I, I kept doing that. I, I just got lucky where one day out of the blue, the uh, editor for NPR's Code Switch, Jaleka Lantigua Williams at the time, said, hey, you want to write for us? And I said, yes, please. Uh, so she said, you know, just, you know, uh, let's just let's just kind of spitball and see what what you might do. So I ended up writing two pieces for NPR's Code Switch. Um, the first one is about um, EDI plans and the idea of interest convergence um, and how they're probably not as progressive as most people think. The second one really got a lot of traction, as you might expect. And that one is about hate speech. And the title of that is Hate Speech and the Misnomer of the Marketplace of Ideas. And uh, that one's about this idea called the empathic fallacy. So um, those circulated. I got a lot of um, um, responses from it, most of them good, uh, some of them not so good as you might expect. This was around uh, 2017. Okay, so it's about a, a couple years after I started blogging. And then I got another email out of the blue from Laura Usselman, who is uh, a literary agent for Stuart Krzyzewski, and said, hey, I read you know, your, your article on hate speech, and uh, do you have representation? And I said, no, <laughs> but let's talk more. And so Laura and I got together, and I signed with, with Stuart Krzyzewski. And we really spent a couple of years on putting together what might be a book for the trade, which I found out is very different from academic publishing. That's a talk for another day. Uh, the first one was a fairly instrumental book that I wanted to entitle Racism Syllabus, you know, that was just kind of walking uh, people through the nuts and bolts of the nature and dynamics of racism. That one didn't seem um, to work out and it really wasn't the kind of book that I wanted to write because, as I said, it was so instrumental and I don't think that that racism really lends itself to that kind of analysis. And then the next one was about Donald Trump and that one really didn't work out. Um, but then we landed on Chinese Prodigal and uh, Laura shopped it. Um, I had lots of uh, meetings with all the big publishers. Uh, two of them wanted to make me an offer. And then I went with uh, Grove Atlantic. And so this is uh, just a screenshot. I was, I was kind of thrilled. This is just from a couple of days ago. Um, so they have it first here, uh, Grove Atlantic. Um, I chose them because I got to work with Amy Hundley, who's a superstar editor at Grove. And I was so excited about that opportunity. Grove also publishes one of my favorite writers, Viet Thanh Nguyen, who many of you have read and the author of uh, The Sympathizer and The Committed. So let's get to this question that I think uh, a lot of you were curious about. Um, which is what is a memoir and essays? And I think some of you may have heard of it before, but it's a genre that you can't count on everybody uh, knowing something about. And so compared to a traditional memoir, a memoir and essays, um, well, it's got chapters that can stand alone. Um, and they're kind of joined by a theme um, instead of chronology. And as far as uh, Chinese prodigal goes, um, the theme, is um, well, there, there, there are multiple themes, but the book kind of has to do with ways that I was overcoming the forces of assimilation for a young Asian American kid growing up in this country um, in relief of anti blackness. And so that's uh, more or less the theme. And it all started uh, because of the death of my father in 2019. I'm not sure if I could have written this book while he was still alive. So it's framed by those ideas where I had a good, but um, I think um, in some ways tragic relationship with my father, given these forces of assimilation, given you know the effect of, of whiteness on somebody uh, who could assimilate and did for a long time.
And so a memoir on essays is aware of the self as socially constructed and fragmented, um, not essential or universal, right? So there's this kind of traditional sense of the self where like who you were when you were a kid, it's kind of like who you were as an adult, who you are as an adult, right? Where you have kind of the same values and they just kind of show up in different ways. And so a memoir and essays doesn't really believe in that, that sense of an essential or universal, of universal self. And instead embraces this post-structuralist idea that um, we're constantly um, making and remaking ourselves relative to the flows of power in our society. It acknowledges the reader as a crucial maker of meaning. I mean, these are essays after all. And so you're actually trying to kind of convince somebody of something usually. And, and memoirs aren't typically like that, where it seems like the author is the ultimate authority over the meaning of what's in the book. And in this case, uh, that authority is absolutely shared between the author and the reader. It sees individual experience as a function of group experience. And what I mean by that is that it's not just this kind of individual um, squirreled away in an attic kind of writing about their lives um, as this unique essence. And instead you see yourself first, not as an individual, but as a member of a group. In my case, you know, that's as an Asian American, right? And there are other groups that I belong to, but that was the primary group. And I had to kind of understand who I was as an individual, as a function of that group identity. And then finally, it's argumentative as much as it is reflective. So traditional memoirs are reflective usually. But as you can tell from the title of my book, I'm, I'm making a number of arguments and I want to convince my readers of um, some ideas that I believe in. These are some memoirs and essays that were influ influential for me. Um, uh, actually, I've, I've read only uh, two of these. One of them uh, I put up there, the middle one from Damon Young, I haven't read yet, but it's the only one that actually says a memoir and essays at the bottom. So I'm um, kind of acknowledging this genre on its cover. But the first one is Thick by um, Tracy McMillan Cottom. And then I think maybe a lot of you have heard of uh, Minor Feelings uh, from Kathy Park Hong, which became very popular in 2021 um, because of the rash of anti-Asian violence in the country. And so this is the um, description of Chinese prodigal uh, from the Grove Atlantic uh, website. And I know that you can't uh, uh, read it very well, but it does say that what I put in the box here that what kind of binds these essays together is my interest in the invention of Asian American identity um, in a post-civil rights America. Uh, that is, I want to I want to imagine Asian American identity relative to uh, blackness and anti-blackness in this country, and I think that's kind of what set my my memoir apart for for Amy and Grove, and and what Amy was really interested in getting out there. These are the contents, the table of contents. I, I know that you probably can't read it very well for the book. And I am going to not go over all of them because I'm looking at my time here and I may not have enough time. But I deal with issues such as raising a mixed race child who's half white. I deal with issues such as affirmative action. I talk about hate crimes. I talk about COVID. I talk about what it means to um, love and marry a white person as an Asian American person and you know how to negotiate those dynamics. Um, and then I talk about, um, in this last chapter, the relationship between um, Asian Americanness and Blackness in the white imagination through the case of um, Akai Gurley, who was killed by Peter Leong in Brooklyn. I don't know if you remember, it was a, a police killing um, that um, kind of captured the the nation's attention at that time. And so I'm really thrilled to be giving this talk to you and reading from my book during Black History Month, because I don't know if this book would exist um, without uh, the Black people in my lives, the Black writers that I've read. I don't know if Asian American identity would exist at all were it not for Black history. I think it's a real mistake to think about it independently of the anti-Blackness in this country. And so that is very much 
uh, what I wanted to explore in the book. And so I'm going to read to you uh, parts from Paper Sun, which is a chapter about how I learned to read, but maybe not in the way that you think, not in um, terms of literacy. And I think it's a, a lesson that I've always tried to impart upon my students. So many of them are here. I'm so happy to see them. Um, that reading is maybe the most important thing that we can do, and I hope that we all learn how to do it right. So I'll, I'll begin the reading now. My good grades led people to believe that I was a strong reader, beginning with my teachers. I wasn't like most of my Asian classmates, non-native speakers of English, who people assumed were bad readers because of their remedial tracking and thick accents. Reading badly is an unspoken expectation for the immigrant here. As ubiquitous these days as bilingual street signs, which meant that whatever proficiency I demonstrated was flattering for everyone involved. I must have called to mind those Asians who win the national spelling bee, whose talent seems enough like reading at first, but by the end of the tournament, reminds people of the kid who can recite the first few hundred digits of pi. It wasn't hard for me to be a good reader in this basic sense. The great abolitionist Frederick Douglass tricked white boys into teaching him letters, a serious crime in his day. Douglas was a true reading prodigy, not because of how he learned to read, but because of how he read. In time, the quantity of our reading will seem more impressive than the quality of it. Most people believe that after a certain age, we end up doing it the same way. Our chance to show off ending with the SAT. Reading is literacy, once again, nothing special. As much like problem solving as driving a car to the store once you learn how. It is not about making decisions, but the opposite, which is putting your faith in the judgments of others. Asians, especially immigrants, are easy to imagine at attention, eyes forward, as if seated at a student's desk. We're here to listen and not to question or worse still, digress. For despite how difficult it should be, white Americans love to tell stories about themselves. The secret to being tolerated, if not welcomed among them, if that is what you want, is simple. All that is required of you, all that has ever been required of you, is to like the stories that they do and to let them tell you why they are good. Several years ago, rummaging through our attic, I came across a box of mass market paperbacks from my days as an undergraduate. Among them was a copy of The Bluest Eye. I didn't quite remember. The one with the photograph on the cover of a black girl and a white doll. The book turned out not to be mine at all, but belonged to my wife, who must have read it in a general education course before we met. I decided to peek at her annotations. Her script had not changed much over the years, and in the same attractive hand that I came to know, I saw the words white view written in pen next to the first paragraph. I wrote nothing of the sort in my books in those days. I was familiar with point of view, which was when the narrator either knew why everything happened or didn't, depending on the designs of the author, who apparently always knew. It occurred to me at that moment, I was over 40, that other students back then were reading Toni Morrison when I wasn't. And this fact on top of the evidence before me of how that was happening, induced a sharp pang of regret about my time in college and the poor choices that I had made. The only course I took as an undergraduate that included black writers was an elective called something like the American South in Literature. And in addition to William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, and Walker Percy, we also read Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker. 
It was taught by a white man, a graduate student from West Germany, then in its last year of existence, who spoke with an accent, but whose English was better than all of ours. I was surprised that he had come to this country to study these writers. But at one point he suggested that Southern writing was the only kind of American literature worth reading for a foreigner like himself. Early in the semester, I caught up with him after class to ask about Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book I was liking very much. I don't recall my exact words, only that I betrayed an assumption painfully that its author, Harriet Beecher Stowe, was black. I'd even read the biographical introduction, which did not mention her race. You know, the author was white, he said, no doubt surprised at how bad a reader I was. I must have thought that only black people would choose to write a book about racism. I was a foreigner too, technically, but my misreading had more to do with my time in this country, which was all but a year of my life. It would have helped me to hear Toni Morrison at Harvard that year. In her lecture, Playing in the Dark, she described how writers such as Willa Cather and Ernest Hemingway drew from fictions of blackness for the iconic stories that went on to define a national literature. Morrison knew that the meaning of what was in front of her depended on what wasn't. It may be how all virtuosos see the world. Before they were great readers, artists like Morrison, I'm sorry, before they were great writers, artists like Morrison were great readers. The first black woman editor at Random House, she worked with most of the black writers in the catalog. Some of her own discoveries like Gail Jones, Tony Cade Bambara, and Henry Dumas. In the six years after she left, Random House published more than 500 titles, but only two by black writers including Beloved. The problem was not bad writers, but bad readers. It was important not to cater to these readers, Morrison told an audience at Portland State University in 1975. There exists, quote, a prison that is erected when one spends one's life fighting phantoms, concentrating on myths, and explaining over and over to the conqueror your language, your lifestyle, your history, your habits, and you don't have to do it anymore. You can go ahead and talk straight to me, she said, promising to be the reader her audience needed. I was in graduate school when I finally took a class solely on black writers. The reading list comprised over a dozen books of post-war black writing, and the only author to rate multiple titles, five or six, was James Baldwin. I wondered if the other students were reading everything that was assigned to us in this class and in others, and I may have finished only The Fire Next Time in Giovanni's room. Our class met at night in late fall in Ann Arbor, and what I remember most fondly about it was our professor putting out a simple tea service for us before we began. His name was Marlon Ross, and he was the first black teacher I ever had. He was a young professor, a romanticist by training, who finished off some of his comments with a low chuckle that revealed a gap between his two front teeth like Baldwin's. It was how he looked one night when he said he suspected that his department had asked him to teach the course only because he was black. I was thinking that it was also my job in the class to discuss what was happening to black people. I chose not to write on Baldwin for the term paper because his novels didn't always make it easy to do that, which turned out to be the point. And besides, in his essays, Baldwin seemed to be more interested in writing about what was happening to white people. Reading for this class was an exercise in self-consciousness. The class was large for the graduate program, 18 students, three or four of whom were black. Mindful of my reading, I was even more so of my speaking, afraid of blurting out an offensive notion during discussion. I was conditioned to be anxious about how white people would receive whatever I had to say. But this was a new kind of double consciousness. Blackness shorted the gap between white and Asian. 
I took longer to share my thoughts, a circumspection that descended upon the others too. We tended to walk back our own claims, but I don't know, our own nervous chuckle. It was hard to say what we meant because we were also thinking about who we were or wanted to be at, the, at that moment. How we read revealed who we had become, whether we knew it or not. The books were our own private Rorschach tests. Instead of questioning them, I began to question my relationship to them. More than anything, I felt accountable for my reading. To Marlon Ross, of course, and to my Black classmates, and even to the others who may have read Toni Morrison already or had a Black professor once. But it was something new to be accountable to myself for my own judgments while reading, even to be aware of those judgments in the first place, especially before I got to the end of the book and believed I knew everything. Reading a book can be confused with finishing it. My best friend in high school, a white kid with a kind face, shot through with freckles, started to refer to others as being well-read, a term I'd never heard before but liked because saying it made you seem smart too. He had finished the autobiography of Malcolm X and told me how Malcolm had believed that white people were devils, but by the end of his life, realized that they were not devils. My friend, my friend seemed relieved to be able to gloss over the prospect of being a devil. Being well-read is not just about getting to the end. Like college-bound students today, my friend had somehow made the book accountable to him with what Baldwin would call the presumption of his innocence. Students are too often taught to make books about racism accountable to them, asked to find something that they relate to, anything as if that is their right, as innocence. There's nothing special about finishing a book, even Moby Dick. I talked about that earlier, my favorite book. Jacques Derrida was once asked if he had read all the books in his library. Three or four, he replied, but I read those four really, really well. <laughs> Plenty were unfinished anyway, as Baldwin and Morrison knew, either because there was no one like you in it or because there was a stereotype who was supposed to be. Rather than confront the reality they had created, Baldwin observed, white Americans instead chose to tell stories to be able to live with themselves. This quote forced Americans into rationalization so fantastic that they approached the pathological. He wrote in Stranger in the Village. He called out the vast holes in logic in their stories because they were nothing more than myths, good only for inventing a people or studying them. I want to say the same about myself, that I saw through these rationalizations of innocence, carving through them as Baldwin had as a child. After all, for as long as we have been in this country, Asians have been mistaken as perpetual strangers to it, as scabs or else spies which is bound to bring some clarity among us, if not resentment. Most of the time, however, I was shown sundry kindnesses, not in spite of being a stranger, but because of it. Perhaps I was the kind of stranger the country had been waiting for, a post heart seller tabula rasa. It took me a long time to appreciate Baldwin, after all, who despised Uncle Tom's Cabin, the first book he had ever read. He outed those who could not tell the truth about themselves, which meant they could never tell the truth about others. A gay man, Baldwin faced censorship of all sorts in his day, but the Central York School District saw fit to ban him too, posthumously, freezing Raoul Peck's documentary of his writing, I Am Not Your Negro. Baldwin believed that writing was a moral act. Reading is a moral act too. Both have to tell the truth. It was the lie of innocence that my teachers should have told me to read for, as Morrison and Baldwin did, not the assonance or the consonance, which only had you nodding your head in time to another's breath. Let me finish up here. I think often about a graduate student from years ago, only because she apologized for being a bad reader. Jane was a white woman in her late 40s, older than I was, and she had come back to school 
to write a novel. Our small master's programs serve mostly locals and near locals who could attend class only at night. High school teachers eyeing a promotion, recent graduates dipping a toe, serial workshoppers. The course was called Critical Reading, Writing, and Thinking. And instructors defined those words however we wanted. Like Marlon Ross, I toted an electric kettle and a tray of teas and cocoa with me to our night class. Jane was usually quiet during our discussions of Asian American literature and criticism. She didn't read like her classmates, who were a generation younger, and knew to look for the ways that race or gender mattered in a book or in their lives. Obama would win a second term that semester. One day, Jane dropped by my office to discuss her trouble in class. She began by apologizing because she wasn't used to thinking that the way she read said anything about who she might be to others. Now I think about everything that I read when I was younger, Jane said, trailing off. It makes me angry. Do you know why you're angry? I asked, uneasy. Well, yeah, she said, looking at me as if the answer were obvious. I would have lived my life differently. Reading a book is not an afternoon under the shade of a tree. It is splitting wood, hard work. Something is at stake for you. Reading is fighting. The greatest Chinese hero, Guan Yu, is usually depicted ready to brawl or else reading, either a pole arm or a book at the ready. Thank you. I think we have about five minutes for questions. Happy to answer them. McKenna? Oh, wow. Um, the hardest part is telling the truth. So I have, I have this sign, uh, and I write about this in the book, that I keep next to my computer. And it says, uh, it's from James Baldwin. And it says, uh, you must write a sentence as clean as a bone. That is the goal. And what he meant was that the longer your sentence is, the more you're lying, the more you're dissembling, and the more you're trying to put on a kind of disguise. Because for a reason that you may not have fathomed, psychologically, you need that disguise to kind of live your life in the world. And so I think your writing is really kind of reflective of how well you know yourself. And that was so difficult for me. And it was one of the reasons why I didn't want to write academic prose when I made that, that shift, because if you've ever read any of it, Maketa, you know it's not clean as a bone. Like it's very difficult to read. And I, and I thought that I could tell the truth without that kind of discourse. But, um, but when you try to do it and your sentences keep getting longer and longer, you realize that there's some pain that you don't want to reveal. It's, it's, it's a clue. And that was the hardest part is being able to tell the truth about something that you were trying to hide for most of your life. Great question. Other, um, other questions? Brian? I just had a quick one. Um, I'm sure I think you have a piece in there from what I could read in the table of contents explain this, but the significance of the photo on the cover. I learned a lot about covers. We went through a lot of different covers, um, Amy and I, and my, my, my agent, Laura, as well. And um, I wasn't uh, um, thrilled about any of them. At one point, uh, Amy uh, said, you got a picture of yourself? And I said, I think I've got one that might work. So the title of the book is Chinese Prodigal. It's a kind of a pun on Chinese prodigy um, because it's about my prodigality, which is about how I, I basically thought I had enough time to do everything. And I didn't have enough time. And I didn't have enough time to go see my father before he died. Uh, but it also references the prodigal son story, right? Where, you know, fatted calf and all that. And this is a picture of me. I think I'm about eight or nine at this ice cream parlor called Farrell's in Dallas, Texas, where I grew up. And um, 
So it's my birthday, I think. And um, the server is bringing me just a big bowl of ice cream. And Amy said, look, you know, I think either Amy or Laura said, uh, if you got a photo on your memoir, it's got to be a little weird. <laughs> and it's got to like kind of stop somebody in their tracks in the bookstore and say, what is going on there? And I love this photograph of myself because I'm like super Asian in it because I am not smiling, right? Like the pictures of all my ancestors on the wall, nobody's smiling. And I love it that I'm not smiling here. And um, they're going, he's about to eat ice cream. Why isn't he smiling? Um, and I think Amy said, um, you know, I presume that this white woman who is the server is actually standing in between you and the person taking the picture, who is your father, I think. And um, I said, I love that. And uh, so that's the significance of the of the photo. Um, is that it, it kind of um, touches all the bases when it comes to what I wanted Chinese prodigal to be about. Alex? Yeah. At the beginning, you were talking about your relationship with your father and his passing, sort of allowing you then to write this book. I was wondering if you just talk a little bit more about that. Yes. Um, you know, toward the end of uh, his life, I think my father grew um, fairly embittered about um, his life. And, you know, I think a lot of it was chemical, right? Um, and um, I, uh, I didn't feel as though I, I could tell the truth um, about our relationship, which, again, was a very good one, but one that was beset by um, the forces of assimilation. Um, that made me think that I could continue living my life here in Eau Claire and I had time to see him before he died, and, and I didn't. Um, but it took me months to kind of reflect upon that truth. Uh, and I think I might have told a really different story had he been alive, uh, because there would not have been any regret. This book is all about regret. I think one thing that my students have heard me say is that uh, if you are a person of color whose parents are immigrants, racism does a real number on your relationship with them. And as you get older, you appreciate those, you, you understand those regrets, right? But when you're younger, um, you're happy that they leave you alone. You're happy that they say, I love you back to you, right? You're happy that they say you're sorry. And now I'm sad that I asked my dad to say, I'm sorry to me. You know, Asian people don't really do that. But that was the assimilation, right? So it was all of these regrets that, you know, as an older person, um, I could process. Did you say maybe the when the book was to be published and how to, how to buy? Yes, uh, I believe you can order it now uh, from all the major uh, outlets, um, uh, pre-order. Uh, I don't think like the, the launch is kind of official yet, so it's kind of making it out there in stages, but it should officially launch um, um, at the end of this month, and then it will be available for purchase August 15th. August 15th is publication date. Oh. Sarita? I'll ask you later. You sure? <laughs> well, it might be a bigger conversation for later, but I guess my question yeah. was just about the kind of reading you talked about teaching your students how to read yeah. differently. I mean, so many enter the classroom expecting a, a kind of pleasure. And yeah. it sounds like you really point out that where that pleasure is coming from. <laughs> The pleasure comes from knowing yourself better. I mean, I, so I teach Asian American literature and I, I say on day one, I said, the, the point isn't for you to know more about Asian American literature um, because you won't, you just won't remember it. Um, the point is for you to know more about yourself by reading Asian American literature. And I think Asian American literature is great 
for getting people, especially white people, to learn more about race because of that really kind of weird location that we've got in between white and black. So you need to ask yourself why you liked this character who got their father to say, I'm sorry to them, right? Why you didn't like this other character, why, you know, why you were sad during this one event, you know, why you were scared at another point. That's the value, right? That's why we read is to know more about ourselves. So that's why it's not important for you to finish a book. And maybe you hit a point where you realize you have to change your life. You should probably put the book down <laughs> and think about that. A little Rilke, yeah. And with some wisdom. <laughs> there. Yes. David. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>